Good evening. I'm Belva Davis, and welcome to This Week in Northern California. We will be with you for an hour tonight. Joining me on our news panel, Mathai Karugula, staff writer with the San Francisco Chronicle on cuts to Oakland's police department. John Weldermuth, also with the Chronicle on initiatives qualified for the November ballot. Josh Richmond, legal and political affairs reporter with the Oakland Tribune on the special election. And starting with Carla Marinucci, political reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle on President McYedef's trip to California. So, Carla, we know there was one big reason <laughs> why he came. Tell us about that. Uh, you know, Silicon Valley was the big reason. It was, it was just an amazing trip this week, I think, for the Russian president. Uh, out of Cisco Systems, he got a billion-dollar investment pledge. Uh, he started a Twitter account. What else do you need to know about that? He got an Apple iPhone 4 from Steve Jobs. I mean, this was all a a trip, a message about uh, how collaboration between California and Russia and, and to focus on Silicon Valley, I think, was really, really interesting. I was at the Fairmont when the president arrived uh, with uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. And uh, I mean, it was just a celebratory moment, but it was so interesting. You had George Shultz there, who was Secretary of State, of course, during the Cold War. And anybody who remembers anything about the Cold War, you know, can look at this with wonder. A week where we had a Russian warship in the bay and the Russian president toasting, uh, you know, champagne with the governor of California. Talk, uh, and at the same time, in the same week, uh, a Russian conglomerate putting up money to save a California state park. I mean, times have changed. So, Carla, <laughs> was this private industry at work or a diplomatic coup on the part? of the Obama administration, who, <laughs> who carried the water here. And I think, I think uh, you know, talking to Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, it's, I think he also deserves credit for this as well. He's one who has um, sort of advanced the cause of international trade, and he clearly was very proud pushing this. Um, uh, the, uh, President Medvedev's um, visit to, to Silicon Valley, he also announced a trade mission to Russia. But then there was this unusual collaboration uh, between one of the richest men in the world, Victor Vexelberg, uh, and he uh, has a group called the Renova Group, and he put up money to save uh, Fort Ross, which is a very important Russian historical site. California was going to have to close this down. It has already been closed down several days a week, didn't have the money. The place was in the red, almost a million dollars. And, and this was the first time in state history that a foreign nonprofit group uh, came to sort of essentially bail California out of its fiscal crisis and keep a state park open. Mm -hmm. In some ways, uh, some people said that was very controversial. There are groups out there saying, shouldn't Californians be doing this ourselves? I mean, what's next? To have the, pre the you know, uh, Carlos Slim, the rich billionaire in Mexico, come forward and put up money to save the missions when, when those go under? I mean, what, but, you know. But it's, isn't it interesting, Carla? That something like that, when you're talking about Fort Ross, something that a lot of people in California recognize and everything, that's kind of almost a people-to-people -people type of uh, type of job, rather than you know Silicon Valley and big million-dollar investments and everything. Fort Ross is something that people can really relate to, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, when the Russian government heard that this uh, park was going to be closed either several days a week or shuttered because California didn't have the money, they actually sent their ambassador to the site. They started opening talks with the Schwarzenegger administration, and uh, that's when the Russian billionaire came forward and said, let's see what we can do. Let's form this foundation. The same billionaire is involved uh, with the president of Russia in trying to open a Silicon Valley development in Russia, and that's where the Silicon Valley uh, connection came in, too. What, what do you think this says about what Medvedev is trying to do with the new Russia, you know, in terms of re it's, redirecting the yeah, economy over. I mean, there. it's a really interesting time in Russia, I think. As somebody who I, I covered actually the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 in Russia, uh, and to see the kind of entrepreneurship, the development, the huge press corps that was with uh, the Russian president from Russia, uh, it shows the changing times. This is a guy who's 44, around the same age of Obama. He's, he's making the point that. Russia needs to diversify its its economic base away from oil. It's got the infrastructure from the Cold War days. It has now a whole new generation of entrepreneurs and money, but it doesn't have the know the know-how 
that Cisco Systems or Twitter or Apple has. And that's why he went right to the home base uh, and to get a billion dollar pledge out of John Chambers at Cisco was really important. Uh, the, the Twitter people also said they were going to study, as did Steve Jobs, in terms of making uh, 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 collaborations with uh, tech people in Russia and here. And this trade mission that Schwarzenegger announced also, he said, means jobs for California and for Russia. So. Well, uh, a new initiative there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Certainly a new initiative. I think we'll a whole be hearing new more front. about it. It was actually interesting to see Russian sailors walking the streets of San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, no so initiatives, John, that's your beat here. We <laughs> certainly have enough of them coming at us uh, from on the ballot coming up in November, and some of them uh, really a, a probably a very high interest. Yeah, there's going to be uh, there will be ten on the ballot. Uh, the deadline was yesterday, and. Uh, we ended up with 10, and there are a whole bunch of things that are going to be interesting. First and foremost, obviously, the one everybody's heard of is marijuana legalization is going to be there. But you're also going to be voting on an $11.1 .1 billion water bond, which is just huge, and it's going to be very divisive. With uh, Right now, we have uh, governor, uh, business and the governor on one side. We have the Sierra Club and a lot of unions on the other. Then you move down the list. There's... Uh, a ballot measure that will put an $18 surcharge on the vehicle license fees. Uh, and in return, you get to go to the state parks for free with the money uh, from that vehicle license fee going to state parks. Uh, you get uh, a couple of redistricting measures. One will uh, extend 2008's Prop 11 to uh, Congress. And the other one, which is supported by the Democrats, will eliminate Prop 11 entirely and give uh, redistricting back to the legislature. So there's a lot of stuff out there. So how much of this is actually a reform of how the way California government runs and how much of it is, is not? Well, it depends what you mean by reform. And that's, you know, one person's reform is another person's uh, really bad idea. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of it is very much aimed at the way California runs. I mean, for example, uh, the governor was threatening to uh, close the state parks a year or two ago. Well, you have one group saying, okay, let's raise money by increasing the vehicle license fee and save those state parks. The redistricting both sides you have out there. Uh, you have uh, a couple of uh, last year in the budget, as part of the budget negotiations, the, uh, everybody agreed on some business, uh, business measures, pro-business measures. Well, the CTA put up $2, two million dollars to say, let's get rid of those measures before they even take place. John, let's talk about the pod thing, because I think I, this is the one where uh, John Burton, the chairman of the Democratic Party, has said he hopes that that's going to bring out the young voters in November? Who is that going to bring out and how is it looking right now? This is when the whole nation is going to watch. Yeah, they will. Uh, I guess the numbers show here and just about everywhere else that it's basically split. They may have 48 percent in favor, 48 percent not in favor. The question, as in all elections, is who shows up to vote. And uh, <laughs> But Quite isn't it also who has the money yeah. to mount the mm -hmm. television right. campaign yeah. that usually For example, the the Oakland man that put up the money to get the uh, ballot, get the money on the ba ballot, put up about a million dollars, says that's it. He's done. They're going to raise other money. So, yeah, and as far as uh, young people coming out, that's, everybody always says this is what's going to bring and young who's people fight out. That measure? Is uh, it law it's enforcement? going to be law enforcement. Right. And that's a very, very tough one to yeah. beat in California. Yeah. And then, John, you've got uh, 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 one measure to change the legislative vote requirement for a budget to to a simple majority instead of two-thirds, but then another one to raise the threshold to two-thirds for uh, for state levies and charges. So again, like two two things at odds with each other, basically, well, if, right? Well, if you look at any initiative in California, the first thing you're going to have, the first question you ask is, who benefits? And nobody's putting up money for initiatives unless they think that there's something, what are they going to make? What are they going to get out of it? So you have the two-thirds vote. You have the unions and the Democrats, state Democratic parties, put a lot of money into that, figuring that they can get their own budgets through without having to worry about Republicans. Did we talk about AB uh, 32? AB 32, we should talk about that too. That is the greenhouse gas measure, which has uh, kind of been Governor Schwarzenegger's uh, tour de force. That's what he's counting on for his legacy. And we have a group here, a number of groups, led by uh, the oil companies, Valero with $1 million, and Tesoro with about $500,000 saying, uh, okay, let's put it up and say, let's suspend it. 
they want to suspend it until California's unemployment rate drops to 5.5 percent for four consecutive quarters. When was the last time that happened? Uh, it's been a while, <laughs> and they're not uh, they're not taking too hard a measure there. They're pretty sure that they're going to be safe for a while if that passes. Well, this is Texas money. It's, well, it's oil money in general, oil but money. certainly Texas money in this case. But I think before it, it ends, you're going to see a lot of the California oil companies out there too. So, what about the opportunities for the for the water bond? Uh, in mm -hmm. spite of all of the economic problems that we have. Water bonds in a tough situation. Uh, the numbers I saw, and there hasn't been a lot of polling, but it showed that 35 percent was in favor going into the uh, going into the early stuff. Eleven billion dollars is an awful lot of money and you know people are gonna say that is gonna require the state to pony up a lot of cash for a lot of years and it's gonna be a tough sell, especially since there's gonna be a lot of groups on the other side saying don't pass it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the whole thing is just, I mean, this is going to be such a long ballot. That's, that's the but question. It's, it seems a, a lot of this is a rebellion against legislative moves, and the mm -hmm. legislative moves are driven by the fact that you need a two-thirds vote to get a budget passed. So is it just that we've come full circle or we're coming full circle so that now the legislature doesn't work because of two-thirds and, and not getting that through, and now we have these ballot measures where it doesn't work unless you can find some money to promote your idea. Well, it all comes down to, you know, somebody has to get politics back into government. Politics is, they used to say, is the art of the possible, the, the ability to accept half a loaf, the ability to negotiate. Nobody wants to negotiate now. Everybody says, here's what I'm, here's my position, there's your position, and there's no middle ground. It's warfare all the time. And the two-thirds on the, you're going to see a very, very late budget this year. It's going to go through most of the summer, and nobody wants to give. And until you can get to the point where they, people are willing to say, hey, let's do what's best for California, you're not going to go anywhere. Well, it's thinking stalemate. Thinking about deals, <laughs> our next story sort of comes out of a deal made in the legislature. That was the lieutenant governor made a deal uh, so that he could be elevated to where he is now. Uh, but in his district, they're having trouble um, coming through with the majority well, and vote to replace it. Yeah, we're going to have a runoff. Uh, actually, not a runoff, a special general election, because nobody in this week's special election broke the 50% mark. So what you've got, the, your major party candidates are Assemblyman Sam Blakesley, Republican from San Luis Obispo, against uh, former Assemblyman John Laird uh, from, from Santa Cruz. Uh, Blakesley finished less than 1,000 votes short of, the, uh, of, of breaking the 50% mark out of 146,000-plus uh, votes cast. So he was very close, but not quite close enough. So now we get to go back and do it all over again on August 17th. All of this came about because uh, when Governor Schwarzenegger nominated Abel Maldonado to be lieutenant governor, the Democrats in the legislature sort of messed around for a while, and they wouldn't confirm him at first, and then he had to be renominated, and then they finally confirmed him. They had waited until it had come to a date when the governor could consolidate this election with November's election. That's what the Democrats wanted, because they know they'll have better turnout then. <coughs> the governor said, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to have special elections in the summer. Three and a half million dollars worth of special elections, but special elections nonetheless. It's a huge district. It spans from, from Santa Clara County all the way down into Santa Barbara County. Uh, you've got a very diverse sort of area there. It does have a Democratic registration edge, but uh, again, with the turnout depressed in these summertime elections, Sam Blakesley was able to get very close, not quite over that threshold. So, Okay, but uh, so it, it does have a Democratic edge, as you mentioned, seven yes, points. Does. That's no small thing. So shouldn't John Laird be able to take that over the top? Or? Well, uh, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, you know, t turnout in California t typically favors Democrats, heavier turnout. Uh, and, and without uh, all, something to draw people to the polls, it, it comes down in, in some part to, to money. Right. Uh, Sam Blakesley was able to muster more money uh, both in, in, in his own campaign and through independent expenditures than, than Laird was. Uh, Laird is 
uh, openly gay, which is fine in the Santa Cruz part mm -hmm. of the district. There are more conservative parts of the district that may have some mm -hmm. overt or covert mm -hmm. problem with that, so that probably plays into it as well. But isn't Blakesley a former oil executive in the time of BP? <laughs> Indeed he is, and that's really what a lot of the Laird campaign became about, uh, painting Sam Blakesley as, as a former oil company worker and, and, and trying to link him to big oil and the whole drill baby drill mentality. Uh, which ultimately didn't seem to work. It cer certainly wasn't enough even, to put Laird ahead. So now, now one wonders what's going to happen, what, what the message is going to be from now until yeah. August. It's, 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 it's kind of funny when you talk about the fact that, you know, Governor Schwarzenegger made a political decision to hold this election like this mm -hmm. because the whole thing revolves around a political decision. Totally. One reason that the Democrats confirmed uh, Maldonado was to open up that seat because it's really important to the it Democrats. It is really isn't important. It? The, the Democrats believe that if they can win this seat, and if then they can turn their attention to the Senate, the 12th Senate district, where where Jeff Denham is termed out and he's going up, uh, he's running for Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, they believe that if they can get those, that if they can win both those seats, they then have the two-thirds majority in the Senate, which is very powerful for budget votes. Of course, there's still three votes short in the Assembly, but they'll cross that bridge when they come to it. Mm -hmm. and, and how long has it been since any party has had a a two -thirds Not number. in recent memory, which is why we have a structural deficit and all of the wonderful things that make California government so incredibly interesting <laughs> here week after week. Uh, it, it doesn't seem likely, certainly, that, that uh, those three assembly seats would come over to the Democrats anytime soon, given the, 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 uh, the gerrymandering of the state. And, of course, we'll see if Prop 11 stays in place, given the, the ballot initiative we just talked about. Maybe there'll be redistricting in a couple of years, meaningful redistricting. Maybe there won't. Who knows? You know, you mentioned uh, the drill baby drill issue, and this this district does include Santa Barbara, where this is a very big uh, issue. Uh, is this is it possible the Democrats it seems want to want to take that drill baby drill theme against the Republicans all the way up and down the line in the state? Are oh, gonna... it, it 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 seems like a winner because I mean public outrage yeah. is obviously very high against BP and by extension you know against the oil industry. And yet, when push came to shove, when the when the commercials hit the airwaves, when the voters went to the ballots, it was not enough to to, to give Laird the edge. Blakesley goes into this next election, the gen special general, with a clear edge, uh, and so so Laird has a, a seriously uphill battle to fight. Matthai, you're dealing with a story that has a different base, and that is the base of local governments having challenges with trying to meet their budgets in Oakland. There's a problem with money to keep the police force where it is with that city's reputation for having a bad record of violent crime. So what is Oakland going to do? I mean, it's, it's the paradox of Oakland. O Oakland has for a long time been defined by the crime issue, and they've, they've always kept um, police salaries rel relatively high because they've thought that they wanted to attract the best cops for a long time. But that's the paradox. Is, you pay the most. You're, you're paying the most uh, for cops because it's a dangerous city. But because you pay so much, you have fewer cops. And the city, the, the budget crisis is affecting cities all across the state. But police is really at the center of the city's municipal government identity. And um, it, it was starting to impede on all the other things that make a city: parks, swimming pools, um, senior centers. Uh, if you cut all of the parks and rec and if you cut all of the swimming pools and you cut all of the libraries you still couldn't make up for the budget deficit in Oakland so they were faced with this choice that the council felt like they had no choice but to cut and they cut 80 police officers which is 10 percent of the department um, which is no small thing in the uh, city with the highest violent crime rate in the state um, so it's but it, it, Oakland is really coming to grips with you know what should the city really be about and how much should it be about police mm -hmm. part, part of this whole issue too this week I know has been uh, the role of Mayor Dellums he uh, he um, w went ballistic on a, on a TV reporter this week that made some news and showed up at a, at a press conference I know I mean has that played into his role or lack of it in the formation of the city budget how much is that Th there's there's definitely an absence of leadership, um, and you know, Councilmember Jane Bruner has done a lot of work, and along with some of her colleagues, to try and craft a budget. But um, you know, th the questions of leadership are, are bigger uh, almost, and you know, he didn't, as far as I can tell, um, have much of an impact on shaping the budget. But uh, City Administrator Dan Lindheim and mm -hmm. Council members have worked very hard at it. But uh, 
it, it's almost a non-factor uh, what Dellum's role was. It wasn't though when when uh, when Mayor Dellums came in, there was a whole cry, 100 new cops, I think was it, and lots of publicity around that. Were those 100? Are they the ones now, or in terms of numbers, uh, being affected by this cut? Um, some of them, uh, I, we don't know exactly who the cops are, but there's a there's a natural attrition. Uh, they went all the way up to 837 officers um, in uh, 2008, and now they're down. After this layoffs, they'll be down to 696. Um, but uh, they were down to 776 through the attrition. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean. Raising the number of police on the force was important because Dellums has made that his central uh, policy yeah. goal for the city. But when you uh, talk to people in the city, this is really something that hits them where they live. I mean, you see the violence and everything and say, well, let's take cops away. What are, what are people saying about this, not just the politicians? Especially since the, what the, one of the proposals is to add a $300 parcel tax onto, into, onto every house. I mean, how that, a lot of people in Oakland can't afford that. Is that going to pass? I mean, well, there's, there's two, different parcel tax, two different ballot measures. Uh, one is to suspend a voter mandate to have a minimum of 739 officers to get a $20 million in parcel tax revenue. That's probably going to pass, and that would... If that passes, they would lay off another 27 officers. If, it, if okay. that fails and the parcel tax fails, they would lay off um, 120 officers. So o so Oakland's nice. in a very uh, precarious position. But a as far as what residents are talking about, I, I, I think it's all over the map. I've been to community meetings. I've been to City Hall. I mean, there are a lot of residents who feel like, um, yeah, they actually care about their libraries. If it means that uh, police, uh, some police are cut, that's that's okay. That there's things that uh, mm -hmm. you know, police cannot decimate the rest of the city, is what several people said at the council and, meeting and on and Thursday. Is there still some negotiating to be done with the OPOA that that could avert some of these layoffs? Or? A absolutely. The 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 police union, uh, Oakland Police Officers Association, is going to negotiate with the. Uh, with some of the council members and the city administration on Sunday and Monday, and that could uh, uh, that could avert some of the layoffs. But it's really the the two ballot measures in the fall are really going to define mm -hmm. how many layoffs ultimately come through in Oakland. Well, my thanks to all of you for joining me tonight. All very interesting stories.